So this is session two. So thanks for bearing with us. We've got a number of great experts for this session two. We've got um, we've got Dr. Laura Perryman, who, as you can see, is joining us from Seattle. And I have to say, Laura, you look great for this time in the morning over there because I know it's very, very early. So we really appreciate you joining us. You look perfect, absolutely perfect. Um, and then we've got uh, Mandy Davidson. Um, who is an optometrist and she's also a medical and professional affairs with Scope, who's based in the UK. And then also joining us, and she's going to put a camera on now in a sec, is um, a lady from Ireland, an optometrist from Ireland, um, Alva Nirena, who runs a number of dry eye clinics actually in Ireland. So we have two optometrists and then Dr. Laura Perman is an ophthalmologist. So you're very welcome to this session. And I think you're going to bring a lot from the questions that we've seen in. You're going to really help to address a lot of the different questions. Um, you know, in the last session, Dr. Patel mentioned about the tear film and things like that. So just before we jump to speaking with all you experts, we just want to look at the tear film. So we have a little video to show you because this is what it's all about. And we need to understand why you need different treatments based on, let's say, what's going on with a tear film. So we'll just get that video up. It's a very short video and we will um, look at the tear film. So we'll just we'll just look at this screen for a sec. And um, instead of video, I'm just going to uh, talk over it. Um, so the tear film is made up of three different layers. So the layer closest to the eye is the mucin layer, and that basically holds the tear film in place. Um, so that way it doesn't move and it can do its actual job. And then the next one is the aqueous layer. So the aqueous, as you can tell, is the watery layer, and it contains a number of nutrients, different proteins, different um, factors that helps nourish and protect the eye. And then the top layer, the, the thinnest layer, is our lipid or, or oil layer. And that really lubricates the surface of the tear film. And it helps, let's say, reduce the friction when you blink. So it's really important. And also, if you ever looked at, let's say, a layer of oil forming on top of water, you see that it forms a full layer on top. So it actually stops the evaporation of water out of the tear film. So these three layers are absolutely fundamental to a healthy tear film. And we will revert back to this a number of times when we actually look at the different treatments available for dry eye patients. So we'll just go to the next slide now because I just want to address something else. Um, so the next slide is on the um, JUVE 2 report. So yeah, where our slides are now helping us. <laughs> a perfect, there we go. So the Jews 2 report, Dr. Kerr Patel mentioned it, and it's kind of a global report. And it took two years of 12 different subcommittees to put together. And when you're Googling dry eye or expert in dry eye, you may often see the Jews 2 or the TFOT report come up. And it's available to everyone. And there's a patient um, actual um, document as well that goes through it from a patient perspective. So Jews 2 basically... Um, they, they took the, all the different research, brought it together, and looked right, what is the ideal management of dry eye? And again, as I said, it's a global approach, which is why we have a global panel here today. So it all started with heat, cleanse, and hydrate. So we're going to really deep dive with our experts into these three elements, heat, cleanse, and hydrate. So on that note, you know, I'm going to bring uh, Maddie Davidson in now. So you, we, we do, we're finished with the slide. Thank you very much. So, Mandy, you're very, very, very welcome. Um, Mandy, you know, I just said that if you Google as a patient and we talk about the importance of research, you will see Jews too. So, and, and Dr. Kaya Patel mentioned Jews too as well. Um, how does it influence, let's say, this treatment or what you do in a clinical setting? Hi, Adele. Yeah, for me, the, the Jews too is kind of my go to. It was compiled by 150 experts, it took a long time to put together. And I know that anything that's in the Jews 2 report is there with evidence-based and it's recommended sort of, or it's, or it's almost like a global recommendation. So if I ever get a, a query or something I'm not sure about, diving into Jews to see what the consensus recommendation for is, is it's great, it's a really good resource to have. And a lot of it makes, makes sense to, to what we do every day. So yes, if, if you hear the word Jews, mentioned or you see it when you googled it is it, it's that go-to resource place for us perfect thank you um so one of the first things it mentions is about heat now we've all experienced a lot of heat depending on where in the world you are in the last few weeks um you know but what does heat mean for eyes okay yeah so um it, it's not quite heat as in 
avoid and got heat that that we can't withstand. But um, you know, on on the tear film diagram there that you talked us through, you, you mentioned the oily layer um, that holds all the tears in, stops the evaporation from the, the underlying watery layers. Now we know that approximately eighty percent of all dry eye has an evaporative element, so we need to try and protect that oily layer. And it's the little oil glands that, um, or the, the where the oil of the tear film is produced is in little oil glands just behind the eyelashes in our eyelids. And sometimes these oil glands get a bit clogged or even blocked up because the oil's got a little bit thick, the recipe has changed. So the heat part here is really all about warming that oil to liquefy it so it comes out of those glands and makes the tear film a bit more stable again. What type of heat, Mandy? I mean, how do you apply heat? Okay, so yeah, heat is, is probably, I think we all think extreme temperatures, but we don't really need a really hot temperature for, for this heat purpose or, or for the heat in, in heat cleanse hydrate. What we need to do is a normal healthy oil is liquid at body temperature. As the recipe changes slightly, as it becomes a little bit um, denatured, as we describe it, um, its melting point goes up. So we need to just heat it slightly warmer than body temperature. And we've, um, Jews tells us, or the experts tell us that the optimum temperature to heat it is around 40, 41 degrees C. So it doesn't have to be super hot. It just needs to be warmer than body temperature, but it's maintaining that heat that is, is the key. And we really need it there for about 10 minutes. And that's why a lot of the, the instructions you'll see on the warming masks say, apply them to your eyes for 10 minutes. And it's really because that you've, you've got to get the gland to temperature and then you've got to hold it at that temperature to enable the oil to melt. It, it's like putting a bit of butter in a, in a, in a frying pan. It's not going to melt instantly. You need to apply a gentle heat over time to warm it up. OK, and Mandy, you mentioned 10 minutes is on the pack. Is that normally recommended then for in general for heat treatments? to help liquefy the, the oil in the glands? With, with the warming masks, yes. Okay. So um, generally, because you have to, the mistake that people make is they might do it for two or three minutes, but the, 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 these oil glands are situated towards the back of the eyelid. So you, you, you're not warming them straight away. The, 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 the warmth has to go through the eyelid tissue as well. So you need to get it to temperature. It is important to do the, to do the 10 minutes. Okay, perfect. And then, you know, I suppose, you mentioned the mask and that like what else have been has been used traditionally or what what have you seen maybe used in the in office treatment let's say if you were to visit you in your clinic versus let's say at home i mean are there different treatments available or you know how would you how do you manage that yeah there, there are some different options available so um in in my practice we can offer ipl which is is a form of, of heat treatment and this is intense pulse light, which is what IPL stands for. You may have seen it or read about it for dermatology. It's been used quite safely for years in dermatology, but it does actually have a, an impact on the, the oil glands, the meibomian glands. It will reduce inflammation and it kind of kickstarts them into, into functioning again. So that's a great alternative, but that is an in-office in um, procedure. And I suppose the other one is um, something called lippy flow that a few of the questions were coming through in the chat earlier about that. And that's essentially like a, a, a big contact lens that you put on your eye and you apply heat and massage all at the same go, at the same time. So that warms and massages the oil out, which is, which is the next step to the warming mask that we do need to cover before I finish talking about it. Okay. And, and just, you, just when you mentioned the IPL there, like, is there a set number of treatments or, you know, just in the last session as well, we have a number of questions that sometimes it works or the number of treatments, et cetera. Yeah. You, can you help with that one at all? Absolutely. So I recommend in my practice that I would do um, an initial treatment sort of package of, of four treatments over um, every two to three weeks. So you're looking um, for treatments, so almost like a loading dose, but it gets you set up. And I think that it, it is a consensus um, that if you do the fourth treatment, it does increase the, the success rate of it. I think it increases it from about 65% to 80, 90% if you have that fourth treatment in the beginning um, session. So yeah, when you when you go along and if your, your clinician offers you IPL, um, I get those four treatments booked in the diary there and then. So they're in the diary and we know we have to, we have to stick with them. Okay, perfect. So, so we've got we've got the heat to let's say heat up the oil to make it a better consistency. 
um, what happens what happens next then or you know what would patients experience normally after doing that part of the treatment okay so if, if we go back home now and we're doing our at-home treatment and we're using our warming mask you've warmed that oil up um, and some of it will come out a little bit, the, the oil that's sat in the, the tops of the glands, but you can really enhance the effects of it by doing a little bit of gentle massage. Uh, we call it massage loosely, but what you're needing, what you want to do is you want to try and move some of that oil out of the glands while it's still warm so that you enable space for fresh oils to, to be produced, but also you get the, the sort of the, the, the poor recipe oil out so it doesn't cool okay. down again and clog the glands. Um, now I've got a little, I don't know whether you're going to be able to see this, but um, I have a little model of a cross section of an eyelid here, and this is the, the glands, and they sit like little soldiers, we've sort of got 20 or 30 in the eyelids there. So once that oil's warm, you need to, um, so you do your 10 minutes, you need to gently massage um, that oil up out of it. And the way I do it, there's lots of different ways you can do it, but the easiest way is I use my fingers and I roll upwards towards my eyelashes, or I roll downwards all along the edge of the lid margin. Now you don't need to press super hard because that oil's warm, but what you're gonna do is you're gonna enhance the effects of that heat um, if you can move some of it out. Lots of patients say they love the heat mask because they, they put it on when they go to bed and they doze off to sleep and find it really relaxing. But if you can do that massage before you go to sleep, more's the better because you will actually um, see the effects a little bit sooner. Um, one thing you should remember though is once you've done that massage, you've released an awful lot of oil into your eye, a lot of the oil glands. It's not dangerous, but you might see your vision go a little bit blurry. And sometimes that's a bit alarming if you're not expecting it, but it's quite normal in a few blinks. Um, it, it will disperse and spread and, and actually your eyes will feel great because you've released a lot of lubrication into your eyes. Um, once I've done that, then we move on to the next step in that I would always suggest you cleanse because you want to get rid of any of the excess. But I'm not going to discuss that because that's uh, Dr. Perryman's bit. But um, um, yeah, that's probably how I would talk to my patients about doing the heat. Mm -hmm. I would I probably suggest they do it every day for a good two or three months, um, certainly till I see them again at their, their sort of follow-up visit. It is a slow process, but if you do do it every day and you're very um, meticulous, you build a habit and it becomes a part of your you know, your day-to-day -day, um, cleansing routine, patients come back after the three months and they, they say, I am starting to notice the difference. It's not gonna be overnight, it's a slow process, but if you stick with it, you really will see the benefits. And I think that the challenge is that, you know, you have to do a little bit at home as well. It would be lovely if we could do it all for you. Even when I do IPL on patients, you still need to do a little bit of your warming at home to keep things going. Okay. So perseverance. Perseverance, don't give up, keep going. Don't give yeah. up, keep going. And Mandy, just, just before going off to Dr. Perryman, you mentioned there about, you know, the massaging and you, you gave that kind of upward movement. Is that yeah. very important to have an upward movement or, you know, because some people be rubbing or, you know, massage traditionally probably is a more circular motion yeah. as well. So just to make sure that we understand that particular point. Yeah, so I again, it, it think of where the glands sit and because the mm -hmm. glands sit, vertically like little soldiers top and bottom and you want to move the oil up the gland I think it's more productive if you follow the, the the path of the gland so moving upwards now whether you you just sort of press and push mm -hmm. a little bit or whether you roll but I think for me the, the best results I get with my patients is if you follow the the direction of the gland rather than just going across the top because you're not it's like squeezing a tube of toothpaste you know, you, if you go from the bottom up, it's going to come out. Whereas if you just squiggle it around on the top, it's probably just going to get a little bit out. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Mandy. So you mentioned there, like uh, once you get the oil onto the eye um, with cleanse. So Dr. Perman, we're going to go over to you now actually regarding cleansing. So, um, you know, we know why it's important, but how how do you cleanse? So again, we we're all used to it from our cosmetic washing faces, et cetera. Normally we're told to avoid the eye area actually, and at times with other traditional products. So what do we do to cleanse the eyes? So Laura, you are on mute, so we'll just get you off mute there. That's fine. There we go. Hi, Perfect. <laughs> good morning <laughs> here. <laughs> it's really early. Good afternoon here. <laughs> So coming, coming a little bit of grace and bandwidth. I'm a little squirrelier than usual, but um, 
Anyway, so nice to be here. Thanks, Doc, for all that awesome information. This is super cool that you're doing this for patients. Thank you for creating an education platform where they can get quality information. Big fan. Um, so yeah, cleansing, that's that middle part, right? Uh, it turns out that it's a little more complicated, right? So we used to think, oh, you know, cleanse it. Well, what's something cheap and easy? You know, baby shampoo. Oh, we now know that that's really not good for the ocular surface. And why? We just spent all this time talking about those delicate oils, right? Mm -hmm. They're not made in great quantity. They're made in nanogram quantities throughout a day. And so the last thing you want to do is overstrip them with a, a, a soap, right? So your facial cleansers should never be in here. That overstrips those delicate oils. Yes, we need to remove our makeup, but only with commercially prepared formulations. I will say that um, we carry uh, a few different wipes in our office. And the one that uh, you guys make up taste is everybody's favorite. The cloth is more generously sized and it's uh, got a softer tooth. It's got a softer feel. So I think patients can get a little more thorough of a cleaning uh, with, with the wipe and it helps get rid of that makeup. We uh, presented some research that if you fail to remove your makeup, it's associated with higher symptom scores. So yeah, it turns out getting rid of makeup is important. It's probably not just the residue that sits there on your eyes all night long. It also has to do with Demodex. We now know that that little microscopic mite loves fatty cosmetics, lives in lipstick for days, <laughs> lives in mascara for days. That's another reason why we don't share makeup, right? So yeah, the, the cleansing part, getting rid of all the day's debris, not only makeup debris, but also allergens, right? So allergens can... Uh, cluster along the lashes. That's what the lashes are supposed to do, is to filter out all of that, the dust, the debris, the wind that can get into the tear film. They have a really important function. If you've ever watched an elephant in the dirt and the way their eyelashes are, that's very much by design to keep dirt out of their eyes. Same with our eyes. Uh, keeps dirt out, allergens out. So you really want to uh, cleanse from the allergen, load, the dust load, the pollutants load every single night before you go to sleep. And that's where commercially prepared eyelid hygiene products really come to, to, uh, to be of great use. Mm -hmm. There's a variety of uh, really excellent products. And then you can pick and choose based on your patient's lifestyle. It's like, oh yes, I you know shower every morning and I'm just, I'm too tired to do anything at night. Great. I've got a gel formulation that you can use when you're in the shower. Ideally, it's at night to get rid of all the stuff from the day. But uh, if that's all the patient can manage, I've got something for that as well. So cleansing is very much a part of it. Demodex accumulates at the lash bases and they create all kinds of mischief. They, um, we now know that uh, blepharitis patients, MGD patients with Demodex have a different oil composition than MGD patients without Demodex. And this has been done on these really cool, complex chemical analysis experiments. So controlling the Demodex load with cleansing with tea tree oil-based products and all of the bacteria associated with the Demodex is very helpful over the long haul. Okay. That was a long-winded answer. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. And you, you've mentioned, let's say, about using a gel, maybe for the shower situation. You mentioned wipes there as well. I mean, is there any way that you you show people to, you know, how to cleanse with the wipes, or you know, what kind of, you know, additional information might you give if you're saying right, cleansing is important, but you need to do it. I mean, my message there, what I'm hearing is you need to do it the right way. Correct. The right tool. So just like know, when we yeah. first start, when we're kids and we're first starting to learn our dental hygiene, right? Mm -hmm. Do you remember chewing on those pink tablets? Yeah, after you, every, all the kids brush their teeth and then you chew down the pink tablets and then you look in the mirror. It's like, those are all the places you missed. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's the same thing with lid hygiene. And mm -hmm. so in clinic, we we'll, we'll see patients back regularly because we do offer IPL and we find it to be very effective and very helpful in getting that patient to a better place. And then they can manage it with their home, their home products, right? Mm -hmm. So that um, we do it a lot and I look a lot. And so I'll look and see how they're doing with their hygiene, mm -hmm. looking for that crusty stuff 
where the Demodex like to hide right in the lash base there. I say, oh, I see you're doing a really good job. Things look cleaner, look better, but you're missing a spot right here. So when you go do your prep before this next IPL, I'm going to take a quick peek at the slit length again, but I want you to focus on the section right here. And if you know, they'll go do it and they'll come back and you know, maybe it's clean or not. I'm like, okay, let's switch to a different cleansing modality. I think you now need a machine to help you with that cleaning. And there's automated uh, rotational vibrational machines. There's something called new lids, which is very helpful in step up therapy in patients that just can't quite get all the debris and crusties off. Okay. And how often then, because you, you said you'll go and check if they're doing it right, let's say, in terms of where they're doing it. In terms of, let's say, how often they should cleanse their eyelids. You mentioned obviously at night, but you know, is it, how, is it multiple times a day and how often, I suppose, or how long do they need to keep that going for? I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> and maybe this is a uniquely American thing. If some's good, more is better. But no, that's not the case here. <laughs> People can overdo it. And I've seen them overdo it. I think twice a day maximum, but typically I think once a day is fine in general, this is in general, unless there's a recurring case of Demodex or seborrheic dermatitis associated blepharitis MGD, there's exceptions, but in general, I think once max twice a day is good. Wow. I think Mandy, I saw you smiling and nodding there because I think it may be a little bit off. Uh, opposite maybe across the pond here that sometimes maybe compliance is not as good on that one but I think the important point here is the frequency keep doing it Um, yes consistency yeah 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 Yeah. and is there a time that you need to stop you know like or you know when do you stop or is it something that you like because you mentioned brushing your teeth there right and that's Mm -hmm. something we all do twice a day most people yeah not everyone I'm generalizing (laughs) But, you know, I suppose, is it a long-term thing to have to manage your dry eye that you need to cleanse regularly? I do think so. I think, mm-hmm. I think this daily maintenance, these daily good habits are really underappreciated and underincorporated as uh, a dry eye community. I suffer from dry eye myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I've learned the hard way that you've got to stick with it, right? It's just, mm-hmm. it's just make it daily habit, that consistency piece, consistency and cleansing, um, is very helpful. And then you can go into your um, dry eye expert once or twice a year for deep cleaning, just like the dental model, where you can, they use uh, special kits and special devices to really deep clean that lid margin, those lash bases, and it feels so good. Yeah, it's just like getting your teeth cleaned. It's like, okay. ah, fresh. <laughs> so when does a patient, so for those that you, you need to do it at home and there's a treat, you know, there's your routine to do at home, When do patients normally come to you looking for that deeper clean? Or is that something you would recommend coming back a certain number of times a year to do that kind of more deeper clean of the eyelid? Sure. So great question. I customized it to the patient, right? Mm -hmm. So not everyone is that is super severe. Um, Mm -hmm. And hopefully patients that have just the mild problem are getting into these good habits uh, from the get-go and preventing those more severe presentations, right? I do think there's a role for that. Mm-hmm. Um, the, uh, I lost, see, it's early and I lost the train of thought. What was the question? Just, just, you know, when, when you need more than just at home. So when you come, Oh, when, when do you need more? Here, right. You know, so when I, do you I call need this... more, even for, even for like, we've got a lot of patients. So when, you know, if the cleansing at home just not isn't, and you need to give that boost or you need, maybe need it more regular, a deeper clean, you know, when when the could come in to see you and then just talk us through that process would be great thank you right so we're talking you know, we're, we're over lumping people right and mm-hmm. dry eye is a busy noisy messy disease state it's like a big circus tent with about 30 different circus animals inside and all the lights are off and you're trying to figure out who's causing the mischief so we're lumping everybody together in the same tent so with that said I would say a general rule of thumb Mm -hmm. is once or twice a year for a deep cleaning and possibly an IPL touch-up treatment, depending on the situation, given that uh, MGD or the oil gland problem is so prevalent. um, That's uh, a a good recommendation once or twice a year for a little little touch-up, keep you you humming along. Perfect. Um, So then, you know, I suppose, how do people get it wrong? Because cleansing sounds simple, but let's say, is there any top tip or let's say the one thing that you would kind of preempt maybe is not going right for, for patients? Mm-hmm. What would you say? What would the top tip be or, you know, compensate for maybe something going, not, not doing it ideally? Yes. Yeah, so I think 
probably my top tip is what's good for the skin is not necessarily good for the eye area. So your facial cleansers are formulated very differently than things that go around the super delicate uh, eye area, all those super delicate, precious oils, you can overstrip them. So that's the biggest mistake I see people make. They take commercial grade face wash, right? And then overstrip these incredibly delicate oils. Um, and so just knowing mm -hmm. skincare is not the same as eyelid care, I think is probably the simplest thing to, uh, to break it down to. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for that. We'll be addressing some of the questions now. We'll, we'll go to the, the next, the hydrate first. So Laura, I'm not sure if you can stay with us or how long you can stay with us, but hopefully yeah, I'm I can see you, now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can I see can you see answering, answering the questions, questions anyway in the chat. Thank, thank, thank you very much, much for that, because that, it is different, different between, between the different, the different countries, countries, et cetera, and different treatments. treatments. So, so um, um, Alva, I'd, I'd like you to join, join us now for the last bit of that HCH. So, so Mandy's done heat, Dr. Dr. Perman's done cleanse. Now we look at hydration. So in relation to hydration, again, I suppose we're all used to drinking water, et cetera, to maintain health and hydration from an overall body perspective. But, you know, for hydration for the eyes, what, what does it mean? Basically, hydration for the eyes means using a drop to supplement your own tear film. And it's very important after following your heat and cleanse regime to use an eye drop because although the cleansing modalities that we use are very gentle, they can still disrupt the, the delicate tear balance. So using a drop at the end of your regime will help just to rebalance your tear film and make the eyes feel more comfortable. And particularly people who have blepharitis or meibomian gland dysfunction, they will generally be following a, a heat and cleanse regi regime. So it's even more important for them to use a drop at the end of their uh, at the end of their regime just to rebalance the tear film, coat the front of the eye with a nice layer of moisture to protect it from environmental factors, and just make the eye feel more comfortable. So again, you can't really, you know, I would recommend that people use their drops around four times a day um, or sometimes more. You know, it is important to use the drops regularly, not just when your eyes feel dry, you know, to try and get into the habit of putting the drops in before you feel the dryness set in, because that way you're preempting the problem and it'll hopefully prevent your dry eye symptoms from being as severe. Um, yeah, so I would recommend yeah, regular hydration in terms of eye drops. Okay. okay, so you mentioned there, you know, yeah. after cleansing, does, um, is it just after cleansing or, you know, do some people just need hydration, you know, because it's four times a day, so obviously it's not linked to the number of times they do cleansing. So are there, you know, you mentioned the four times a day, but like are there patients that just need to hydrate? Yeah, most people would need to keep their eyes hydrated all the time, particularly people who have been dry, diagnosed with dry eye disease. But it's important to use a drop that is specific for your type of dry eye, because some people may be deficient in the watery layer or the aqueous layer of their tears, and they would need a drop that supplements that layer and increases the volume of tears in their eye to maintain the hydration. Whereas there, there are other people, particularly some people who suffer from meibomian gland dysfunction or blepharitis, they tend to be deficient in the oily layer of their tears. And that deficiency in the, in the oily layer can vary, you know, with different individuals or between different individuals. So it's important to use a drop that has been specified, you know, as being the best one for you, because certain drops will help spread the remaining oil that's in your tears, whereas other drops will replace the oily layer completely. You know, so it's important to see your eye care practitioner get drops that have been recommended for your type of dry eye and use them regularly throughout the day. I mean, it, you know, sometimes it's no harm if you've been told to use your drops four times a day to kind of set up landmarks for yourself during the day to remind yourself to put your drops in. So maybe put them in in the morning, put them in again at lunchtime, again in the evening and before you go to bed at night. Or if you know you're going to be doing something specific that could cause your eyes to dry out more, like driving on a long journey, you know, you could put your drops in before you start, or if you know you're going to be on the screen for a couple of hours, put the drops in before you sit down to the screen again. And, you know, keep your drops beside you when you are on the screen so that you can use them regularly throughout the day. Perfect. Thanks. Um, you know, I think we've getting a lot of questions regarding screen use. I might just dip in there now. So 
um, you know, I suppose green use for chocolate use in their drops, obviously it's a key cause of dry eye disease. I mean, is that something that you're seeing more frequently in your patients that they're experiencing dry eye due to computer usage, et cetera? Okay, Alva, did you hear that question? Yeah, I did. I yeah, perfect. I'm going to myself now. Um, yeah, what happens uh, when people look at screens, we do know that their blink rate reduces. And blinking is the eyelid's natural way of excreting the oil out of meibomian glands, because when we blink, our eyelids meet, press together, and the little glands are squeezed gently, and our eyelids then spread a layer of lipid uh, over the front surface of our eye, so coating the eyes with the lipid. When people look at a screen, their blink rate reduces, so they don't blink as often as they would normally do if they weren't looking at a screen. But as well as that, when they blink, their eyelids don't tend to meet. They do a kind of a flick blink like this, where their eyelids don't meet. So often the mebum isn't being expressed naturally or as often as it should be out of the eyelids. And that can then cause the mebum in the eyelids to kind of thicken. And it's a vicious circle, you know, and then blinking becomes uncomfortable. So people blink less because of that and the mebum thickens further. And that is a vicious cycle that kind of leads to, to more intense dry eye. So we do know that if people are using a screen, the important tip is every 20 minutes, they should look away from the screen and they should do 20 good blinks where they're squeezing their eyelids together and expressing the mebum out of the meibomian glands. And this is especially I, uh, with COVID and people working from home and doing more screen time. I would say that anecdotally in practice, I have seen far more dry eye than I would have seen previously. And definitely we are seeing more dry eye in younger and younger people and in children. Again, because they, their screen time has increased with the prevalence of iPads and iPhones and things like that in society. So yeah, blinking is very important to spread the oil over the front surface of the tears. Limit your screen time. If you can't limit your screen time, just take regular breaks from it. And a regular break doesn't even have to involve getting up and walking away. Just look out the window and do 20 good blinks. And that helps to express the mebum out of the glands and spread it more evenly over the tear film. Thanks, Alba. So I hope everyone is starting to blink now because we've been on this for a while now, our screen. So I can't see you all, but I hope you're all blinking there now. So Alba, you mentioned the importance of, you know, the like, and we know from the tear film that there's different ways to treat a dry eye in terms of the type of hydration to use. I mean, if someone can't access or doesn't have an appointment with an expert like you guys, I mean, what should they look out for if they need to go into a pharmacy or chemist and go and select um a, a, a hydrating product. Sorry, I keep being muted there. Um, they should look for a drop that is preservative free because long-term use of a drop containing a preservative can actually irritate the eyes. So that it's preservative free is very important. They should start off with a drop that contains hyaluronic acid because hyaluronic acid supplements our own tear film and improves the volume of tears. So I would start off with a, a non-preserved drop that contains hyaluronic acid and not a drop that whitens the eyes because drops that whiten the eyes can sometimes just cause the blood vessels to shrink and temporarily they may make your eyes look better, but they won't necessarily treat the underlying cause or manage the symptoms of dry eye. So a lubricating eye drop that contains hyaluronic acid would be a good one to start with. And then use it frequently and if you're not getting the results that you would expect or your dry eye isn't improving, then I'd recommend that you go and see a healthcare professional who has a particular interest in dry eye. Thanks, Alva. And, you know, you brought something very interesting up there because we get a lot of questions regarding red, red eye. And we often are looking for probably quick fix. It's very cosmetic. It's very visual red eyes. So, um, you know, when you mentioned that, that some products may not be good. It may actually be actually causing the issue. So can you Alba, can you give a little bit more on kind of redness, um, you know, and, and, and how to treat redness, not just, I suppose, cosmetically. Um, often the redness will come from inflammation. So if your eyes are dry, your eyes will become inflamed because there's friction between your eyelids and your eyeball when you blink because there isn't enough lubrication there. So that's often where the redness and the inflammation comes from. There are certain drops on the market that will make your eyes look whiter, but they work very temporarily by just shrinking the blood vessels in the eye. And as soon as you stop using those drops, the blood vessels will come back 
sometimes even redder than they were to begin with. So you need to first stop using the drops that, that shrink the, the blood vessels to make the eyes look whiter. You may get kind of reflex redness as a result temporarily, but then if you treat your dry eye or manage your dry eye by doing your heat cleanse and hydrate, if you have blepharitis and meibomian gland dysfunction, by using your drops regularly, maybe using an ointment at night, you should see that the redness will gradually subside. So the drops that give the quick fix aren't necessarily the best option long term. It's normal for eyes that are very dry to be quite red and inflamed looking. And it does take time to treat the underlying cause of the dry eye. And in time, you should see that they, the eyes look less inflamed and look healthier and more comfortable and less irritated. Okay. So I suppose it's important to look at not the symptom and not just the cause. I think is the, is the point there. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Right. I mean, drops will treat the symptoms. Drops will treat the symptoms, but they don't address the underlying cause of dry eyes. So that's why a lot of people will get drops, maybe use them for a few weeks, even 10 days, and then stop using them. And they wonder why the dryness comes back, because the drops really only manage the discomfort associated with dry eye. It doesn't address the underlying issue, which is causing the dryness or causing the inflammation. And that's what needs to be managed long term. And patients educated so they know how to manage that using treatments that you know things that they can use at home or treatments they can have in practice and getting the best combination of both and i suppose it's important for patients to realize that dry eye is a long-term condition that needs to be managed you know there is no quick fix there's no quick solution it's about teaching people how to manage their dry eyes so that their eyes will be comfortable and Alva, just on that particular one, you know, you mentioned there about the spray and an ointment and drops, etc. So obviously, as well as like you mentioned, like looking for preservative free and, and something with hyaluronic acid. What, you know, and you but there's different formats of let's say hydrating products out there. And I suppose, you know, even from a US, UK, Ireland perspective, it's an eye drop or a lubricant or an ocular lubricant or artificial tear. There's lots of different terminology. But just to go a little bit more, if you wouldn't mind, just between a spray versus an ointment versus drop, et cetera. Um, you know, what, what, what do you see in your patients? What do you recommend? I suppose there are different drops that people use during the day, can use during the day, and different drops will contain maybe different amounts of hyaluronic acid um, and will have different consistencies. So often for during the day, a drop that is quite light is beneficial because it won't blur your vision. But for nighttime or evening time, you may need a thicker drop that where the hydration will last longer. But then there would be drops that are specifically formulated for a, a, a dry eye, which is deficient in water or, or where the watery layer is deficient. And those drops will increase the volume of tears in your eyes. But then there are other drops which are designed to improve the quality of the oily layer of your tears. And that's why having an assessment done by somebody who has a specific interest in dry eye can help you find the best drop for you. And as I said previously, certain drops will supplement your own lipid layer and, and spread the remaining lipid that you have more evenly over the front of the eye. Other drops will completely replace your own lipid layer if you're that deficient in oil. Now, it's very important when you use your drops that you read the instructions, you know, because different bottles work in different ways. So, you know, you can have a bottle like this where the, um, it's a dropper method. So one like this, where you have to pump the bottom of the bottle to get the drops to come out. And then there are other drops where you need to manage the bottle a little bit differently, something like this one, which is a very small bottle, but it's an emulsion. So all you need is a nano droplet in order to feel the benefits of this one. So that's why it's important that you read the instructions on the bottle so you know how to use your bottle um, in the way that works best for you. Then for more severe dry eye, there is an ointment that people can use at night and the ointment is quite thick and quite viscous. So a lot of people find that it does blur their vision a little bit. So it's important not to put it in until you're just ready to go to sleep. And some people find it tricky to put in. So the best way to put it in is to put a tiny little bit of the ointment on a clean finger 
and just rub it inside your eyelid. And then with heat, it will, it will spread over the front of your eye and coat your eye with a nice even layer of lubricant to keep it moist throughout the night. Yeah, that, yeah that's, that's a question we get about night time, you know, if you should do something additional for night time, um, you know, and, and maybe you mentioned about even blinking. And I think there's somebody asked in the, in the chat function regarding, you know, their eye doesn't close fully at night. I mean, so is there any additional advice, Alva, that you give on that particular, for that particular patient? Yeah, you can get micropore tape in the pharmacy. So um, you can tape the eyelids shut and that tape is quite gentle. It doesn't stick to the eye too much. So it won't rip off any of the eyelashes in the morning. Um, you can also get shields that you can wear because some people, particularly as they get older, can tend to have floppy lids. So when they go to sleep at night, their eyelids can actually turn inside out and the eye can become exposed during the night. So you can get shields that you can wear over the eye to prevent that from happening as well. Or particularly if people sleep with their kind of face turned into the pillow, again, the skin around the eye can become pulled slightly and they may need a shield to wear at night then as well. So micropore tape or shields, which you should be able to get in the pharmacy, can help with that. But a lot of people aren't aware that they sleep with their eyes slightly open. So sometimes you need the, op the optometrist to prompt you and then you need somebody else at home just to check when you're asleep. Is there a gap there? Thanks, Alva. Mandy, I just might bring you in now because I know we would have talked before because Alva was mentioning about the different bottles and um, by all means, Laurie can jump in here too. But, you know, for people maybe with that may find bottles difficult or have dexterity issues, you know, what would you normally, you know, recommend for those people or what advice would you give? That's a really good question. There are lots of people that do struggle with bottles and sometimes it's people even without dexterity problems because nobody's ever explained to them how to do it. And, and suddenly once you say, oh, you use the bottle like this, the, the problem's gone and it, it isn't actually a problem at all so communication is so important if you don't understand what your clinician has explained to you ask them to explain it again and ask them again and again until you understand get them to write it down because you know you've you will have had an awful lot of information in this session and it is information overload sometimes and it's hard to recall it and even the silliest little thing like using the bottle can sometimes get forgotten so never ever be afraid to come back and ask but lots of bottles there, there are so many different bottles we haven't we, we couldn't possibly bring every single bottle in here to demonstrate but lots of them do have sort of compliance aids to make things a little bit easier so if I just show you the one and um, Alva very beautifully demonstrated the the, the bottle the, this particular bottle the Comod bottle so it's we call it the bunny grip with the two fingers on the top and a finger on the bottom and then you just squeeze but if you really can't do that there is a little device called a, a, a comply and this is great because the bottle fits into it and then you can see there's a can you see there's a little hole in there so what you would do is you would rest it on your eye. So you use it with two hands. So you've now got double the, the pressure to apply if you've, you've got weak fingers. You pop it on your eyelid. You can have your head back up, look through the little hole, and then you can just press that down. Now, please tell me, Adele, was I in camera when I did that? <laughs> um, and that's a, that's a great help for this particular bottle. Now, there are lots and lots of different devices out there that, that make squeezing the bottle easier. There are some that are particular to the particular type of bottle. There are some universal devices out there. But if you're struggling, talk to your doctor, talk to your clinician, and they will be able to advise you on the best device to use. And you know what? Sometimes it, it, it just doesn't work. And you have to think of another type of bottle or another way of actually getting the lubricant into your eye. And that's absolutely fine. You know, don't ever be afraid of going back and say it's not working for me. We'd much rather know and find you an alternative. OK, perfect. Thanks, Mandy. So keep trying or look for the solution. There's yeah. just, if you've yeah. experienced it, there's probably somebody else out there is the message. Yeah, and, and probably, come back and ask. Come back and ask. Never, okay. never be afraid of asking. OK. Um, I see a, a lot of the chat function there and Dr. Perman, I'm actually going to you because it's something that was brought up earlier on by Dr. Patel and also um, 
Claire, our patient that we had in the first session regarding online forums and stuff like that. And one thing that has come up actually quite quickly is Vaseline. And I see that you're addressing some questions there in the chat. Do you just want to just make sure, because I'm not sure if everyone's looking at the chat, but do you just want to comment on, on that question that you're just after addressing there regarding, Alva talked about ointments, you know, and, and creating that nice layer to help protect the eye at night. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if you want to just address that, that, that would be great. Yeah, so I've heard a, uh, a lot of great things from my colleagues here on the panel and totally agree with that. I do see some common mistakes amongst patients. Um, again, that if some is good, more is better mindset that doesn't always work. Um, one of the uh, complications I see is eyelid dermatitis mm -hmm. from using plastic wraps to form a reocclusive seal. So I actually don't recommend this. If um, you get symptom relief for, from it, tell your clinician, but then they will recommend something that's gonna be safer for the skin, right? Because one of the things we know about dry eye, my booming gland dysfunction, you know, this whole blepharitis problem is that the bacteria and uh, fungal composition of the mm -hmm. organisms around the eyes are abnormal, right? And when you, when you do things like cling wrap, you're contributing to that abnormal bacterial and fungal load around the, around the eyelids and you can get a pretty rip roaring dermatitis. So I actually don't recommend that all. And the Demodex love it. Like you're giving them free party zone, right? So I guess there's, if you're really having trouble with that much exposure, please talk to your clinician. Perhaps you're severe enough that you need a oculoplastics reparative procedure, or you need treatment for your sleep apnea that's inducing your floppy eyelid syndrome. So please, uh, consult with your clinician if that is the case. Okay, perfect. And just, I want to bring you back because you mentioned Demodex earlier on when you were talking about the importance of cleansing and I suppose that after coming up there again. One question we've got in is in relation to rosacea and mm -hmm. Demodex. So, you know, are there specific advice, is there specific advice you give to your rosacea patient that when they experience Demodex? Yes, so I'm, I'm so glad you asked this question. This is a uh, rapidly evolving area of clinical research. We do clinical research here in Seattle at the Perryman Eye Institute. And it's just, it's been eye-opening, <laughs> excuse the pun, <laughs> of how bad Demodex is, how much of a problem. So it's estimated around 60% of the MGD blepharitis patients do have Demodex. We know that Demodex is commonly found in the context of rosacea. Um, rosacea is a disease of the oil producing units and the mites eat the fat. They, 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 they're like Jack Spratt's wife. wife. They, they don't eat lean, they only eat fat. So there's, they just have a hater. You can actually see load in some of the rosacea patients as you scan across the nose, you'll see little dermal colorets. Just like when you look down, you'll see lash-based colorets. If you pull those and look under a microscope, you'll see Demodex. If you look at my Instagram feed, I have multiple videos and photos showing, um, showing Demodex. So getting them under control by removing their crusty debris from, they've been partying all night, get, getting rid of all that stuff, cleansing is important, and then controlling the load. So they, they, um, they are, they're filled with bacteria and that bacteria can accumulate around the area and induce more inflammation. And that's where things like the hypochlorous acid also come into play. I do very much love your spray. It's a great value. It's a very effective product. Um, but that helps to control that bacterial component that comes along with Demodex. Demodex is commonly associated with rosacea as well. So we clean the face mm -hmm. um, and the lids and lashes every single day. And then in the office, what we'll do is a deep clean and then IPL to kill them. We've published um, videos showing Demodex. Uh, it, it, you can kill it on the glass slide once you've epilated it uh, from a patient with IPL. So you control the load. Uh, with mm -hmm. IPL, with deep cleaning, and then the patient can maintain that good clean, clean slate with their home care routines. Okay, thanks for that, because I, I think it is something that we get questions a lot regarding, you know, and, and we're getting a lot of questions regarding different conditions. And I suppose, Mandy, maybe I'll, I'll come to you on this one, but, you know, we get a lot of questions regarding oncology patients, you know, diabetes, etc. So, you know, um, is the management of dry eye different in those patients or, you know, what advice has, have you got from that perspective? Yeah, and, and again, it's it's a question we do get asked a lot. And um, there are a lot of systemic conditions that can lead to dry eye. 
but ultimately managing the dry eyes is pretty much the same. Um, yes, you need to try and address or manage the cause and some of these systemic um, conditions you have to manage, you've got your specialist and you, you manage them as best you possibly can. But even with the best management, you're still gonna get symptoms. You then have to take that away from that and manage the dry eye as, as dry eye itself. So you would still need to lubricate. You'd still need to keep your eyelids nice and healthy or in the best possible shape that you can. So, you know, really, it doesn't matter where it's come from. You you need to work out the type of dry eye that you've got and then target your management for that specific type of dry eye. Um, just maybe acknowledging the, the causative factor that might need addressing by another special reality, but the, the dry eye is, is pretty much the same. Thing. Okay. And then, you know, one other question that we got, and I suppose guys is where we're taking all of your questions and getting the answers from the experts now. So please, you're doing great. Keep the questions coming. Um, just in relation then to maybe the underlying cause or, you know, looking at like cooling therapy from a mask versus hot therapy from a mask. We talk about heat and, 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 and Laura, you can join us. So, I mean, Laura, I don't know if you want to take this one, but, you know, cooling sure. versus versus heat. Um, you yes. know, what, what, yeah, the question really is, is it, it's kind of not controversial, but let's say where and when. Exactly. It's a where and when. So, um, it, you know, using that same circus analogy, there's not always just one animal causing the mischief, right? So sometimes it's seasonal allergies. So seasonal allergic conjunctivitis, seasonal allergic rhinitis is a direct driver to my bone main gland dysfunction. We now know that there's an immunologic bridge between ocular allergy and MGD. And so we only have a few things to block that bridge, but in the context of an allergic response, cooling can be very helpful with the itch and the wanting to rub and the rub creates more friction, uh, cooling down some of that inflammatory response, the edema, the swelling around the eyes associated with seasonal allergic um, or cardiologic. Let's say you go visit your grandma this summer and she, her, she's got cats and, and dust mites and everything else. So that would be a flare up that would need treatment. Take your kit with you, take your drops with you, your cleansing, um, all that stuff. Maybe do it twice a day. Use your topical allergy controlling eye drops. Try to avoid the orals if you can. And then cooling can really help with some of the discomfort associated with an allergic response. Okay. That's a very interesting point you make regarding, well, first of all, your triggers you know, what's triggering the dry eye, but you mentioned there about your oral. So is that in relation to the antihistamine, uh, Dr. Perman? Right. Okay. Yeah. So the oral antihistamines, I mean, I joke with my patients that if you're having a life-threatening anaphylactic reaction, fine, take it. But <laughs> short of that, no, because it makes your dry eye worse. It turns out that the oral allergy pills are very, not very effective in controlling ocular itch in part because it dries out your lacrimal gland, it decreases tear output, which is your natural defense against allergens, right? So you don't want to compromise your tear production rate. You want to increase it. Um, so uh, those allergens just sit on the ocular surface, cooking things like a barbecue. It's just um, with all the inflammatory mediators. So that, uh, yeah, anyway. Okay, perfect. I, I think it's important that we know that because there are, you know, and I think, uh, you yeah. know, Mandy, when you were mentioning about the different conditions, there are medications that cause dry eyes. So it's probably something you guys all do automatically is to review what medications people are on. Um, I mean, are there any other watch outs there regarding medications? I don't know who would like to take that. So the panel is open. No pressure. <laughs> I'll take that one. Yeah, I'll take it. Uh, so common um, blood pressure medications such as beta blockers and diuretics directly contribute to dry eye. Some antidepressants, not all of them. Um, and it turns out that it's very important to treat a commonly found depression element with our dry patients. Mm -hmm. You got to have a lot of grace and compassion for it because it is common for people to develop anxiety, depression. There's medications that are less drying to the surface. And once the brain feels better, the patient can cope better and they can manage their disease better. So I think it's an underappreciated component to dry eye disease is the, is the psychological impact of it. Okay. So it, it can be effectively treated. Um, the older generation antidepressants tend to be more drying than newer generation okay. ones, less so, and also very effective. 
at low dose. So those things are important to know about. Diabetes is an underappreciated contributor to dry eye. That induces um, a, a, a uh, neurotrophic keratitis. You know, we're aware that they develop peripheral neuropathy, can't feel the bottoms of your feet, not aware that you stepped on a splinter, infections, all those sorts of things. Well, the same thing happens to your corneal nerves and you can develop what we call a neurotrophic keratitis where the nerves can't do their job in uh, sending all as well messages to the ocular surface. And they also can't do their job sending the signal to the brain. Hey, it's getting really salty in here. I need more tears. Can you pump it up, please? Um, just like the AC that we all need right now. <laughs> They're just because it's hot. More, please. More cowbell. Whatever. No, I'm joking. But um, so there's there's a uh, those are the main sort of medication things. But there's alternatives for the blood pressure meds, mm -hmm. um, the antidepressants, all those things. Okay, perfect. Thanks. I think that's a really important area. And there's a few more questions coming in, but they're very mm -hmm. specific. But I think you know, I think that's one thing. Watch out for the meds as well, especially yeah. if you start on a med and then suddenly you get dry eye you know is a link there and I think one thing that may cause and, and Alba, I might go to you on this one anxiety as well is let's say the um you know does it cause does dry eye cause vision, vision issues you know if you find that your vision's not as good you know do you have patients coming in maybe with that complaint Definitely, particularly in patients who would have extreme dry eye, if their tear film is deficient, I mean their tear film is the outermost layer of their eye through which they are seeing. So when light enters our eye, it passes through a number of mediums, but it passes through our tear film first, then our cornea, our lens, the vitreous, before it focuses on the retina, the tissue at the back of the eye. And if there are any irregularities in any of those surfaces through which light passes, light is diffracted more and people aren't looking through a nice, clear, uniform medium. So it can cause blurred vision. Yeah. But it's also important to remember that some of the treatments that we use for dry eye can temporarily blur people's vision. So it's not unusual after somebody has worn a, a warming mask for their vision to be a little bit blurred for a minute or two afterwards because a lot of oil is being excreted into their tear film. And that's a question that comes up a lot in practice. People ring up the day after they've used their mask saying that they've noticed blurred vision. So it's important that, that we tell them beforehand that it's normal to get that. And just popping in a drop into your eyes rebalances the tear film and will we'll return it to its normal level and you'll have clearer vision again. So yeah, some people can get can get blurred vision with dry eye, definitely. I'd like to add on to yeah. what, what my co excellent colleague over there said. Sometimes, again, this falls into the camp of some is good, more is better, but that's not true. Patients push too hard on their eyes and they create a temporary corneal warpage as the source of their blur. So, you know, be gentle with your precious eyeballs, right? <laughs> Just approximation, not strangulation with the heat. <laughs> yeah. And, and actually, I think, um, you know, as well, just to, we talk about vision, oftentimes we use contact lenses, obviously, to have improved vision. I mean, what's, what's your guy? And I think Claire mentioned it earlier on in our session one, how actually contact lens, she couldn't wear contact lens with dry eye. I mean, what's the relationship there between contact lens causing or, you know, worsening, et cetera, dry eye? So again, Dr. Perman, if you want to kick off there and, and Alva or Mandy, if you want to add anything there as well. Um, well, it's funny you should ask that question because I think that's when I first became aware of my own dry eye. Mm. It was in my 20s and tried to wear contacts and just could not find anything that was comfortable, no matter how hard I tried. And that's probably when my dry eye was becoming an issue. Um, so yeah, being able to comfortably wear contact lens is uh, a uh, it's something we can achieve with with in office treatments. There are, however, on the exact opposite end, mm -hmm. there are cases where the corneal nerves are are atrophic. That we call that neurotrophic keratitis. And even though that contact lens may not be uncomfortable it might be uh, contributing to mischief on the ocular surface. So there's, again, two extremes, two ends to that elephant. Okay. Is, and and Alva, I might just go to you. Is this a cause of frustration? Because again, you know, regarding contact lens and being able to wear contact lenses and maybe and not being able to wear them due to dry eye, you know, 
Yeah, and I can relate to that as well, because definitely I would be aware of my own dry eye, particularly when I wear contact lenses, which is why I tend to wear glasses most of the time. So it is important to manage the underlying dry eye first, then to try different contact lens materials. You know, we, we may have to try a few different ones um, until we find one that is the most comfortable one for the patient. And then also often a contact lens wearer will need to use hydrating drops while they're wearing their contact lenses. And it's important that they choose drops that are compatible with contact lenses that they can put in while they're wearing them. And again, when they're wearing contact lenses, it's important to use a drop that's not too thick or too viscous, because if it is, it can blur their vision because the drops tend to stay in the eye a little bit longer when somebody's wearing a contact lens. So that's why the ones that are specially formulated for wear with contact lenses tend to be more liquidy and they also would be preservative free. So a few things to look out for there. Um, okay, I, I'm just got, I'm just reading through the questions here. One other question that's come in, I think, you know, it's going back to our, our blepharitis, um, you know, regarding, let's say, the Demodex brevidus burrowing deep inside of my bone, my bone moon glands, and just the whole tea tree oil, you know, in terms of its treatment or when's more needed, etc. So, you know, I suppose the role of tea tree oil and maybe the different even formats there. Um, uh, Dr. Perma, I see you, you nodding there. Maybe you want to start with that one um, and, and yeah. just fill us in a little bit more. You know, when is well, more needed, like ivermectin or, you know, like just bring us through okay. the treatment or what's sure. used and the so, efficacy. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. I think a wave of panic went through the dry eye community when um, a cell culture paper was published uh, saying that tea trail is bad for my mommy gland patients and sent this ripple of panic through the entire dry eye community. And really what that paper showed is that at certain concentrations, tea trail is just fine. And it turns out that for, for cell survivability, right? So just take that out of your head, that tea trail is bad. So at concentrations that are commonly found in commercial preparations, right? Such as this and such as the wipe, these are at low enough concentration that you don't need to worry. The, um, there, that low concentration is very effective in addressing the bacterial load. The concentration is not high enough to kill Demodex. So you still need to go in there. It, it turns out you need 15 minutes at 5% teach rail, which is beyond human tolerability limits. <laughs> it's, like a, it's, it's not something that we do. So we control it within office strategies with deep clean, with intense pulsed light. And then the home maintenance strategies, keep your, you know, do your daily routine on your lid cleansing, hydration, heating, et cetera. Uh, and then if that's not enough, then we'll layer on topical um, anti-demodex triple creams in the U.S. We can get them compounded for a very affordable um, rate, and we use a triple cream. So it's uh, oxymetazoline, ivermectin, and niacinamide at one percent, one percent, and two percent respectively, all combined together, and it's only sixty dollars a month. And that can be a nice additional level of control for the demodex uh, load and some of that vascular. Um, hyper reactivity that many of our rosacea patients suffer with. Okay, I, I think it's, it's interesting because we I've seen now about three or four questions come in through the different channels regarding the TTO and that and you know how mm. you know it's and maybe even with the, in a you know we're talking about blogs and forums earlier on that maybe you know just to make sure you're getting the information from the right source and, and, and that that it's it's got its role it depends where the treatment and the type of patient. Okay yeah. perfect. Um, I'm actually just just one thing there as well before I we've got a lot of questions about supplements, but just before I pop on to supplements, just somebody saying that probing appears very controversial still and not used a lot in Europe. And maybe the panel can give their their views on that. Um, Mandy, do you want to start off with that one? Um yeah, people don't probe. I know it. some people love probing and some people don't. Um, I don't think it's hugely big in the UK. I think there are some specialist centres that do it. 
um, with the premise that it is going to unclog that that gland orifice. But I, I would probably leave it there. I um, it's not something I personally feel comfortable with, but that doesn't mean it doesn't work for some people. Okay. I don't know about uh, whether Alva or, or or Dr. Perryman have have different views. Um, sure, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, so yes, we do do mask and probing, but I don't lead with it, right? I want to give my other tools a chance to work. I've gotten pretty good at identifying at the initial visit, you're probably going to need probing. Um, and that's usually long standing disease, but let's get the inflammation load under control. Let's get this demodex load under control. Let's get you set off with the right healthy habits. We want to prime the pump. So that when I do relieve that obstruction, the my bone marrow glands can deliver. We will also layer on um, IPL series before and a couple after the mask and probing. That seems to give them a big push in that direction. And then also things like neural stimulation help to keep the mybum flowing. In addition to the home care, right, that we described extensively of the worming and that gentle massage expression. It's like squeezing a tube of toothpaste from the bottom. You got to get the cap off. So that the cases where the cap's still on there, those are appropriate mask and probing patients. So in our practice, it's about, I don't know, maybe 5% of our patients, but we're able to avoid it um, much of the time. But when you need it, it does help. Oh, I'm yeah, no, it's not something that optometrists here in Ireland would routinely do. Um, we would have to refer to an ophthalmologist for probing to be done. And as of yet, I haven't found any ophthalmologist in my locality who does my and gland probing. So it wouldn't be commonly available in Ireland, as far as I'm aware anyway. So that's why it's important to have all of your guys' views, depending on where the patient is coming from. So just then, just to move on to then, so we've gotten a few questions on regarding supplementation. Um, so I suppose just in general that we're asking about supplements and also maybe specifically on the omega fat so um you know mandy do you want do you want to give us a little bit about because i know you use it regularly with your patients supplements. yeah so i i always talk about supplement well i talk about diet and um, i take on the whole holistic view to start with and we have a chat about diet hydration and all the things you can do to help yourself over and above just your hch um but some for some of us we don't ingest enough of the good fats, enough of the good omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and there, there is supporting evidence to suggest that these omega-3s will be beneficial to our, our tears, our meibomian glands, the quality of the oils. So if somebody isn't going to be able to eat enough oily fish or they don't like eating fish, then I will, I will talk about supplements um, and introduce the idea of taking a, an omega-3, but a good quality omega-3 supplement. Um, and Patients really do notice a difference. It, it can be, you know, a, almost like a deal breaker. It, it just suddenly everything else clicks into place when they're sort of doing working from the inside out as much as from the outside in. And Mandy, how, you know, when you are giving advice on the supplements, I mean, um, is it a certain number of days? Is it every day? How long should they, you know, how long does it take to get the see the improvements, et cetera, with the supplements? Okay, so it, it's not a, it's like all, all of these therapies, not a quick fix. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a while for it to get into your system. And it might be six to eight weeks before you start to notice a significant improvement. Um, there, there's lots of studies out there with, with different um, amounts of, of omega-3 that you should take. It's, it's all about balance. It's, you know, our Western diets, we have too much omega-6 and not enough omega-3. So if you can increase the omega-3 and reduce some of the omega-6, then you're doing yourself a huge favor. Um, but, you know, if you take a, approximately about a, a gram of, of omega-3 every day, um, you should start to see some um, improvement in your symptoms of dry eye. But everybody's body chemistry is different and everybody might need you know a slightly different dose there are higher doses recommended there are specific products designed for the eye as opposed to just a general omega-3 supplement and um, but but I think my advice would be keep it as pure as you possibly can so your body can process so I have it. to ask you a little bit more about that Mandy so you mentioned high quality and pure yeah. what what do you mean I suppose what, what should you look out for I think you need to look out for um something that is so it's, it's been re-esterified, but it's had an additional process 
in. So you, you get a bit of oily fish and you squish it and you get all the, all the good oils out. And then you, um, you pass it through, um, you add alcohol to it and you, you purify it. And a lot of the, um, the fish oils are left as what we call the ethyl ester form. So they've, they've, they've gone through all the, the process that they need to do, but they may be the ones that um, you take and sometimes that they get a bit repetitive in the afternoon and you think, oh my goodness, I've, I've taken some fish. But if you then take that, that oil and then you re-esterify it and you remove all the alcohol again, you've got a really pure form of the fish oil and it makes the bioavailability to the body um, much greater and you can process it your body doesn't have to undergo with any book read your label and you know you get what you pay for um i know it's corny but with supplements it you really do you need to look at the amount of epa and dha in on the label with omega-3 because quite often it, it's labeled as omega-3 and it's got lots of fillers in it but it's the dha and the epa that you really want to um to, to look at and yes as, as our, our great colleague Abe has just put in the chat there look for rtg on the label and that will tell you it's, okay. it's a re-esterified triglyceride form and dr Perman, i might go to you because i suppose i, I think the supplement you know usage is is you know it's, it's known to be slightly higher in in the u.s do people come in already in supplements do you have to review the supplements as part of your you know your consultation with the patients or how does supplements play a role in the conversation that you have with patients so I, I was doing a little happy dance when uh, Dr. Davidson was talking about the uh, the role of nutrition and omega fatty acid supplementation, because we do the same. We talk about <clears throat> nutrition, fatty acid supplementation. We recommend the Whole30 Diet, W-H-O-L-E, um, as a really sound way of addressing uh, dry eye, especially associated with rosacea. So it's just an easy thing to do. Um, we like, we very much like a uh, hydro eye uh, for the synergy of omega-3, omega-6 in the right ratio. Cause it turns out when you give them together in the right ratio, you shunt things away from pro-inflammatory and towards anti-inflammatory. I think of, um, it reminds me of the wizard of Oz and <laughs> when you have the two of them together, you can drop the house on the wicked witch and squish the flying monkeys and out comes Glinda the Good Witch when you do the two, the two, uh, uh, the mega six and the mega three together in the right ratios. So I think uh, I simply only take things that have dry eye research behind it. And there's a very few. So there's lots of products out there, but the ones that have clinical research to back it up, those are the ones that I am great with people using. We will also play around with, uh, we'll check vitamin D levels. I live where the sun doesn't shine and uh, so vitamin D is a little bit of, a, of an issue and that has a role in your immune function. So I'll occasionally check vitamin D levels and recommend uh, supplementation if it is low. We uh, will also add on some really interesting dietary uh, supplements, something called um, Kirkerman in a highly bioavailable extract form is helpful for body-wide inflammation and has some pretty interesting clinical research behind it. Not much in dry eye yet, but many of our dry eye patients suffer from other medical conditions and there is uh, some clinical research supporting its use there. So yeah, we're a big fan of supplements and eating right. Grandma was right, you are what you eat. I think you mentioned the vitamin D there because you know it is, well, I very much so across here in Ireland, you know, we do not get enough vitamin D um, synthesized in our skin. So it's something, you know, I only heard there about two weeks ago that some people do routine vitamin D checks just because it's from an inflammation perspective, it is anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. So it's something I think that's new to the conversation regarding supplements as well. So it's very interesting that you brought it up there as well. Um, just, I want to, I want to, we're getting lots of different questions. So I'm, I'm jumping between topics, but Alva, I'm going to come back to you because you mentioned about screen use. Questioning regarding, you know, yeah, I, you, I work in front of a computer all, all day. I Should I get glasses with screen, screen protection okay. built in or, or is wearing glasses recommended yeah. in general okay to protect the eye? Well, it depends on whether you have a prescription or not, you know, really. So you'd need to go to your optometrist and have an eye examination. Um, and quite possibly, if you have a prescription for glasses, particularly near, it may help your eyes 
stay more relaxed so that you blink more naturally. Um, but you would need really to have an assessment done to see what your prescription is. Another tip is just to have your bottle of hydrating drops, you know, your lubricating drops beside your computer and try and remember to use them regularly. Blink. But again, without having an eye examination, it would be very difficult to advise somebody as to whether glasses are necessary or not, you know. OK, so just, you know, sometimes there's a lot of marketing regarding blue light and glasses for anti-blue light. So is that some, and especially maybe even with your younger patient who are gaming much more, is that a question that you get asked in clinic? Um, we do get asked about glasses that block blue light. And as far as I'm aware, there is very little evidence to support a blue light blocker on its own, particularly glasses that have no prescription in them. You know, there's very little evidence to support their use, particularly for screens, because as far as I'm aware, the majority of blue light that we're exposed to actually comes from daylight and sunlight, um, more so than from screens. So again, I would be hesitant to tell somebody to go out and buy a pair of glasses that just block blue light. I would really want to see them first to see is there a spectacle prescription there or is there a binocular vision issue there that's making it difficult for them to focus comfortably on the computer or on the screen and rule that out first before I'd be going down the role of, you know, giving somebody glasses with a blue light blocker on it. Thanks, thanks, Abba. So watch, watch this space, really. Yeah. And yeah. OK, perfect. Um, just one, we're, we're down to our last few questions. So uh, thanks for your, your energy. And we, we've got lots of questions from both sides. We'll send them in and to our expert panel. Um, Dr. Parman, this one is for you because you mentioned about hypochlorous acid. It's quite a new ingredient, I think, out there. So I, I know that you you guys may have used it in the US slightly you know, earlier than in the UK and Ireland. So can you just touch back on hypochlorous acid for a day? Really, the question is, what is hypochlorous acid here in the, in the, <laughs> the question? So, uh, and what, what does it do, I suppose? So if you've got information right. there, that would be great. Sure. Oh, thank you for that question. So hypochlorous acid is a molecule that your own body makes. The white blood cells make it as a way of killing foreign organisms. So okay. it's, it's a cleaning agent that is natural and innate to your body. They've recently been able to figure out how to mass produce it and package it. So this is a wonderful method for addressing the abnormal bacteria load that can happen that is, let me check that back, that we know happens <laughs> with dry eye, meibomian gland dysfunction, Sjogren's related dry eye. The, the microbiome and the different bacteria around there are very different than a normal patient. And so this becomes a great way of cleaning up the, the Demodex debris from their guts um, cleaning up any kind of bacterial imbalance. Uh, maybe there's a seborrheic dermatitis component. So it's a great way of addressing um, any of the abnormal flora uh, method. And me, I'm brave. I, I just, I, I don't, I have good control of my squeeze and blink. I can put drops in when I'm driving down the road. I don't recommend that, but I do do it on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> and this is this uh, spray. I'll just uh, raise my brows, gently close my eyes, and, sh 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 and then I'll just pat it into my lashes and around the eye. And that uh, gives me, and then I just let it dry. You don't have to rinse it off or anything. So it's a great way of controlling the bacterial component of things. Okay. I think, you know, we all hear about health and the microbiome and the importance of the, a good, healthy microbiome. So what you're saying there is just stopping those opportunistic bacteria controlling them and getting the maintaining as good a microbiome as you can so it's a very holistic approach yeah. I suppose in terms of managing yeah. that okay perfect yeah. um you um I, I don't see many more questions coming in so um you can take a breather so I mean I think I'm going to I'm going to wrap up the session because it's been it's been a great session the amount of engagement has been fantastic so thank you to all of you guys out there sending in the questions we hope we've we know we haven't got them all but we know we hope we've addressed as um a lot for you guys um so I'm just going to to wrap up so look there's a lot of materials that we said um regarding you know top tips and different links etc and Laura you mentioned your Instagram feed there as well so it's do you want to just it's dry eye master correct if anybody would like to follow you yes 
Perfect. And I know I follow you, Laura. So, you know, I'm, I'm always you. learning every day and, you know, there's great content and information. And I suppose thank you for making it practical, practical, because I suppose that's the function of these sessions as well, to make it really practical for the patients, for you guys. And, um, you know, that's something that we're always striving to do. And we've had a number of questions regarding different innovations, etc. In, in the sessions. And it's something that we're going to address in the future, because things are happening quite fast in this area there's new technologies there's new treatments there's new ways of managing things so we will take on board your questions regarding that and we look at our next patient session um, to to actually cover and address some of those particular items um, I personally, you know, want to thank everybody in the back room. We hadn't a smooth start, so I thank everyone working in the background and thank you all guys for keeping with us. I know Amy has done amazing work to pull all of this together. She came on at the very start in the first session, but Amy, it's amazing. And we've got Mark there, we've got James, we've got Chris in the US supporting us, um, and Helen and Tom there as well. And we've also Michael Moore, who's one of our clinical moderators. So a big thank you to all of you guys in the back. Um, I can just say again, thank you to our expert panel, and I really appreciate, let's say, the level of detail that you provided as well. Um, we have a little questionnaire that's going to come up on your screen after we close the session down. So I would encourage you to feedback what you liked, what you'd like more information on, what you'd like to see the next time, because that really does form how inform how we actually move forward with all of this. So I, I. We've, we're finishing um, a few minutes early because we've got through so much and thanks for the efficiency there. I'd encourage you all to go and blink now and look away to your 2020 regarding our blinks. We've been on screens for a while. And all I can say is have a nice rest of afternoon or if you're coming from the US, have a nice day. And we look forward to welcoming you all again in the future. Thanks guys, bye.